Good morning. We are so glad to have you here at the ICR Discovery Center today. And we hope that your time is enjoyable as you learn about our creator and his creation. My name is Joel. I'll be your host today. And here in just a moment, we will be hearing from one of our scientists. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him. But uh, let me mention, first of all, here uh, on the screen behind me, you'll see a uh, little informational slide. And if at any point during our speaker's presentation today you have a question for him, you're welcome to go ahead and text it to that number there on the screen. That's 94090. Text ICR first and then send a second text with your question. And you can do that at any point during the uh, presentation. If you think of something you want to ask, go ahead and submit it that way. If you're not a texter, we'll have the opportunity at the end for questions, and you can just raise your hand at that point. Uh, today, we are live streaming this presentation to YouTube. For those of you here in-house, if you don't know about this, we have a YouTube channel, and we've got several of the speakers' presentations up on our channel that you can go back and watch, and this, the presentation today will be made available as well. And that's uh, youtube.com slash I-C-R-O-R-G. I want to give a special shout out today to Aiden, who's watching on YouTube Live all the way from Florida. Okay, today we will be hearing from Dr. Jeff Tompkins. You can see his credentials here behind me. Uh, he has advanced degrees in genetics from Clemson University. He also uh, was the head of a research lab there that dealt in genomics. And I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit more about that. But currently, he serves as our director of research here at ICR. Uh, he's an author of a couple of books and is a contributor to our free monthly magazine, Acts and Facts. Today, we'll be learning some evidences that debunk evolution and prove creation. So if you would, help me welcome Dr. Jeff Tompkins. All right, welcome. Well, let's get right into it because I've got a lot of info to go over in a short amount of time. I'm going to be talking about debunking evolution and proving creation. You know, God commands us in his word to, to have an answer, an apologetic answer for these questions of our age. And it says here in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And in this day and age, you need to be ready to defend your faith in regards to uh, evolutionary uh, speculation that people will often hit you with. <clears throat> so what about science? Um, does the Bible and what it says support science? Or does it support evolution? And is evolution really science? And so we're going to be talking about that today, and I'm going to show you today that science uh, unequivocally lines up with the scriptures, and evolution does not. And in fact, God says this in his word. In uh, Romans 1:20 uh, through 22, the apostle Paul said, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So according to the word of God, if you really take a serious look at the world around you, and you look at creation, God's existence, even his Godhead, is undeniable. <coughs> So anyways, I want to talk today about three different areas. I want to talk about the origin uh, of life. I want to talk about the fossil record, and I want to talk about human origins. And I'm going to show you how each of these areas completely lines up with what the Bible says. So let's start with uh, biological evolution and the timeline the evolutionists will give you if you go to a, a secular university and take classes in evolution. They will tell you that 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth uh, somehow magically evolved. 3.6 billion years ago, the first cells then somehow appeared 
uh, spontaneously on Earth. And then three to six million years ago, which would just be a blink in the eye uh, of evolutionary time, humans evolved from a common ancestor with apes. And every single bit of this was due to time, lots of it, chance, and random processes. So what is this biological model of evolution that, that is being pushed? Well, first of all, you need to have chemicals that are, that are biologically significant um, form in some sort of a primordial soup. These chemicals then need to polymerize or bond together to form uh, biomolecules that actually are information rich. And then these molecules somehow are supposed to have magically come together to form cells. And then these single cells then over millions uh, of years evolved into multicellular creatures into all the plants and animals uh, that you see on the earth today. And so anyways, this is the basic uh, evolutionary story. The fact of the matter is there's only two way, there's only two options as to where uh, life came from. Life either evolved by natural processes, and once again, time and chance and random processes, which you can call materialism, and somehow that created life, or life was created by a creator. There really are no other options here. Either life created itself, or a creator created life. So what does the evidence point to? Well, evolutionists tried to start uh, by creating the basic biomolecules that supposedly would have led to life, and they were trying to simulate some sort of a primordial soup where these, these chemicals magically uh, appeared and came together. And to do this, they had to use a highly engineered contraption. <laughs> so this, was, this would not really be representing uh, really early life on the earth, but really man's ingenuity. But anyways, this is about the closest they actually came to creating the chemicals that you need for life. So in this, in this uh, contraption, basically you had water and um, ammonia that was boiling there, and then the vapor uh, from that went up through a tube, and then it went into a chamber or an electrode, um, was basically charged across these, uh, these gases, and then uh, the compounds were then condensed, and then in, at a trap at the bottom of this contraption, then you could pull off these chemicals. The problem is, is if you let everything keep cycling around in a circle, you would destroy the chemicals as fast as you made them, so they had to have this trap uh, at a bottom. So anyways, they claim that this engineered contraption somehow represented a, a crude uh, pool in the primordial <laughs> earth where life somehow magically got started, supposedly maybe by lightning strikes uh, zapping the pool or something like that. So uh, there was a lot of problems with this experiment. And first of all, they were only able to create very small, minuscule amounts of the very simplest amino acids needed for life. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And proteins are kind of the powerhouses uh, in your cell that, that do a lot of the work. They, but another problem was not only did they create extremely small amounts of these amino acids, but they were both left and right-handed versions. Well, molecules, just like your hands, are the same, but, but, but are, but are uh, stereoisomers of each other. Chemical molecules like amino acids can be either left-handed or right-handed as well. But the problem is your body and the, and the cells of living things only use left-handed amino acids. So this contraption actually uh, created a mixture of both left and right-handed. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the experimental conditions destroyed the molecules uh, as fast as it made them. But the thing is, is that we have a chicken and an egg kind of situation going on. But it's actually worse than what came first, the chicken or the egg, because you need DNA to code for protein. And from the DNA, an RNA copy is made that basically is the template for the protein. And so in other words, you need RNA and DNA to create proteins, but you also need proteins or these machines to copy DNA and to replicate DNA and to make RNA. So all of these things 
DNA, RNA, and proteins are all dependent on each other, so it's a three-way situation that's worse than just, say, a chicken or an egg two-way situation. You need all of these things coming together at the right time inside a cell for life, not just a few random amino acids popping up in some primordial soup. And, of course, evolutionists themselves have, have recognized this problem. Sir Fred Hoyle was a famous astronomist who calculated uh, the actual odds of a protein, a single protein arising by chance, and that was 1 in 10 to the 40 thousandths. And he actually said that that was the same chance for a tornado to sweep through a junkyard and leave behind a Boeing 747 uh, fuel of, full of fuel and ready to fly. So those are just the odds of getting a simple protein coming together through random processes are basically impossible. But you know how I mentioned that life requires DNA, RNA, and proteins to get going? It's actually even worse than that because you need lipids to create membranes to basically form uh, the boundary uh, for the cell or the cell membrane to enclose everything within the cell. You need carbohydrates in the cell for basic metabolism, for signaling, for, for forming a cell wall, say, in, in plants or fungi or bacteria, which have cell walls, animals don't. And so basically, it's even more complex than just needing DNA, RNA, or proteins. But it's amazing the faith uh, that some evolutionists have. And this is a guy who is fairly famous. His name's David Deemer. And he has made a career out of trying to figure out how life might have got going randomly on its own. And he actually poured what he thought were all the basic essential chemicals that you would need to build a cell, including lipids, mixed them up in a beaker, and then went and poured them in a mud puddle, thinking he was going to get life. Well, I think we could all, most of us in here, <laughs> could tell him what he would get. You know, absolutely nothing. But anyways, he says this in this book, uh, which I actually have in my office, and he says the results are surprising and in some ways disappointing. It seems that hot, acidic waters containing clay do not provide the right conditions for chemicals to assemble themselves into pioneer organisms. So in other words, he put, all, just assuming all these chemicals magically uh, popped into existence somewhere in the deep primordial past, he actually put them all together in the same beaker, which is, you know, not reality, but then on top of that, poured it into a mud puddle thinking he was going to get life and was surprised nothing happened. Well, let me give you some more quotes uh, from evolutionists who have recognized this serious problem for, for where life came from. Harold Morowitz, who was a biophysicist, tried to figure out the chance of a bacterium resulting by the chance combining of pre-existent building blocks, much what David Deemer did in that previous slide I showed, coming together to form a cell, and he, it was one chance in 10 to the 100, uh, what is that, 1 billion? <laughs> Sir Bernard Lovell, an astronomer, uh, in his in the center of immensities, basically said uh, it was effectively zero. And Francis Crick, who was one of the guys who discovered the structure of, of DNA back in the 1950s, said life itself in, in its origin and nature, it can never have been synthesized at all any time. So even evolutionists have recognized that, that where did life come from, basically it's, it's a huge problem uh, with basically a 0% probability of even happening. But let's just assume life came into existence magically and evolution got on its way. Uh, evolutionists would tell you that you are an animal and that you share a common heritage with earthworms. And this is basically a quote from a basic biology textbook. So this whole idea of life evolving from, from simple to complex actually got going by Charles Darwin, who, who tried to represent it in a tree form. And he was one of the first people to basically develop these evolutionary trees and promote them. So this is basically the concept of evolution, that, that, or the highly theoretical concept of evolution, that you would have single-celled creatures at the base of life 
And then as evolution progressed, you would begin getting plants on one branch of things, and then animals on the other, and then fish and mammals and so on. And the evolution should form this nice, uh, neat uh, evolutionary tree. And so there's the evolutionary tree where you just got basic groups of animals kind of broken down. But that's not really what we see at all when we look at life today and when we look at the fossil record, which we'll talk about more in a bit. We actually see clusters of things. And that's exactly what the Bible tells us, that everything was created after its kind and that its seed is in itself and it only reproduces after its kind. And so humans only make more humans, dogs only make more dogs, and frogs only make more frogs, and roses are just roses. We never see one fundamental type of creature evolving or changing into a new one. And of course, the scriptures are quite accurate on that. So do we actually see an evolutionary tree when we look at, at biological life across the spectrum? No, we don't. We see what a lot of creationists would call a creation orchard. In other words, we see branches uh, of life like humans with a lot of variation in them or dogs with a lot of variation in them, but we don't see any av evolutionary precursors leading up to these types of creatures, nor do we see these creatures evolving or changing into something else. In other words, we just see individual branches uh, in a creation orchard. But in, the, in the, the, the Darwinian evolutionary model, this is how it supposedly uh, is supposed to work. You would get mutation. In other words, there would be errors in the DNA, and then somehow those errors would magically create new, important, and useful information, and then nature would magically somehow select that individual with that improved uh, mutation, and then over billions of years, you would get evolution. There's a lot of problems with this. First of all, we don't see, we don't see a mechanism for evolution happening right now. Do, we don't see DNA actually creating new useful information. We see mutations basically degrading DNA. In other words, we see devolution, not evolution, going on. And of course, when we look at the fossil record, we see no evolution occurring uh, in the past, nor we do we see any evolution occurring now. And in fact, evolutionists themselves are now recognizing that there's huge problems in their model for evolution. This is actually um, some information that I got from a, a conference in 2018. It's, the name of the conference was Evolution. But look what they said on the website. And uh, they said, for more than half a century, it has been accepted that new genetic information is mostly derived from random error-based events or mutation. Now it is recognized that errors cannot explain genetic novelty and complexity. So in other words, evolution now has no mechanism, and even evolutionists are recognizing that they've got a huge problem. And of course, we don't see evolution happening now, and I put these pictures up because they're kind of humorous, but we don't see this kind of thing going on in the present world, nor do we see any mechanism that would allow this to happen. But more, more importantly, we don't see evolution happening in the past. So let's talk about fossils. Let's talk about the fossil record. What do we see in the fossil record? Well, we see sudden appearance. In other words, different types of creatures, whether it's apes or humans or different kinds of fish or whatever, they all appear suddenly in the fossil record with no evolutionary ancestors. They appear fully formed just like God created them. And we also see creatures staying the same, and paleontologists would call this stasis. In other words, a creature will appear suddenly and then it will stay the same. And in fact, there's many creatures in the fossil record, which I'm going to show you, are hundreds of millions of years old, and they look exactly like their modern living counterparts. That's called stasis. And we don't see any transitional fossils. We don't see one type of critter evolving into a fundamentally different type of creature. There's no transitions going on in the fossil record. 
And so this is Stephen Jay Gould. He was probably one of the most famous evolutionists of the modern era. Uh, he actually died of cancer a few years back. But anyways, he was very outspoken about the reality of the fossil record and the problems that it presented for evolution. And he said this, the extreme rarity, which means absence, <laughs> of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and the nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, in other words, imagination. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. And so Stephen Jay Gould was very, uh, even though he was an evolutionist, a diehard evolutionist, he still recognized that there were no transitional forms in the fossil record, and he was a paleontologist. But let me show you what I mean by this. So this is a, a shield bug a fossil, it's supposed to be 50 million years old. It appears suddenly about 50 million years ago. Now, I'm, not, I'm just using these, these dates, not because I accept them as being valid, but just to, to prove a point. Uh, and this point I'm trying to talk about is what's called sudden appearance and stasis. Well, look at a modern shield bug that, are, that is alive and well today, and they look exactly the same. No evolution going on there whatsoever. Uh, this is a creature that was supposed to have uh, appeared 65 million years ago uh, in, in Cretaceous rock, and evolutionists actually thought that this was the first creature to develop legs and walk on land. And they called it, it's the coelacanth. Well, it turned out <coughs> the coelacanths were found alive and well in the early 1900s by fishermen. And they weren't even close to land or even walking on land. Actually, they tended to live about 300 feet below the surface of the water. And if they got close to the surface of the water, they would die because they're because of the way they're constructed, they had to live deep under the surface. And so they weren't even close to walking on land, and they looked exactly the same as they do in the fossils. And so evolutionists called them living fossils. <coughs> so here's a lobster fossil, supposedly 100 plus million years old. And what does it look like? It looks like lunch. It looks like exactly modern lobsters do. No evolution going on there whatsoever. You notice I keep going back deeper here in evolutionary time. Frogs supposedly appeared 350 million years ago, and they look exactly like frogs. No evolution there whatsoever. What about horseshoe crabs? They're alive and well today. A horseshoe crab supposedly first appeared in the Cambrian 400 plus million years ago, and what do they look like? Horseshoe crabs. No evolution going on there whatsoever, and there was nothing leading up to horseshoe crabs that would have been an evolutionary ancestor. They just appeared suddenly in what's called the Cambrian explosion, and they look exactly like they do today. Well, these are brittle stars. Brittle stars supposedly appeared 450 million years ago, first appeared. And what do they look like? They look like modern living brittle stars. In fact, there's brittle stars all over the oceans. And they look exactly the same, sudden appearance and stasis. What's really cool is that scientists or paleontologists have been able to find fossils preserved in amber. And so this is tree sap. That, that trapped insects and things, and then hardened. And so these are amber fossils, and here we have a 100, supposed 100 million year old cricket and a scorpion, and you can look at these fossils in excruciating detail with a microscope and, and, and see amazing uh, facets and things in, in these just like you would a living one, and they look exactly the same. There's no evolution there whatsoever. Anyways, why do we have fossils anyways all over the earth? Why are there billions of dead, buried things? In fact, more than 70% of the earth is covered with sedimentary rock, sandstone, limestone, and shale, which is produced by a flood, a global flood. And of course, we know that in the scriptures, there was a global flood about 4,300 years ago, and it killed all life on earth except for what was in the ark with Noah and, and, and a lot of water creatures. 
In fact, we have marine fossils at the tops of mountains. Why is that? It's because the entire Earth was flooded uh, at one point in time. Only cataclysmic processes can account for the many types of the geological features that we see all over the Earth, including all of the billions of dead buried things, or the fossils. And on top of that, we see lots of organic matter and soft tissues in these fossils, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which indicates that they were not buried millions of years ago, but just a few thousand years ago. So we have these massive fossil graveyards all over the world, and they're in flood-formed sedimentary rock. So that's how, how do you create a fossil? What happens when something dies out in the woods or, or out, out in nature? It basically rots and decomposes, right? So to create a fossil, you have to bury something very quickly and then compress it with a lot of pressure, and that's how you form a fossil because otherwise creatures out in nature would just disappear eventually through decomposition. And in fact, fossils show mass mortality like something really catastrophic happened to them. So this is a uh, marine reptile, a Kyphiosaurus, and this is in, in the Triassic uh, system. And as you can see, these marine reptiles in that one picture were all buried in mass together. They were all buried suddenly as they were swimming around. And then we have trilobites uh, from the Devonian period, which were just buried, heaps upon heaps of trilobites, buried rapidly and quickly all at once. And so we see this sort of thing all over the Earth. And on top of that, we know that this, that these fos this fossilization process occurred very quickly because not only do we see these massive uh, fossil graveyards, but we see stuff that, that decomposes very quickly being fossilized. You know what happens to flowers out in your yard after a few days when they die? They disappear, right? Well, we know that based on fossil flowers that we see in sedimentary rocks that they were buried rapidly and quickly in a massive cataclysm. And even such things that don't have skeletons even left their signatures in the fossil record and were buried rapidly and catastrophically like octopus fossils and squid fossils. And then we see stuff like this where creatures were literally buried in the act of, here we have a fish eating another fish, and on the bottom there we have an ichiosaur giving live birth and buried catastrophically while it was giving birth. So this tells us that, that Noah's flood uh, is true. It, just, it was a violent cataclysmic uh, process that created these things. Uh, this is one of my favorite fossils, and it's kind of hard to tell what's going on there, but there's a schematic kind of showing what's going on, and this is actually from National Geographic. So here's what an artist did to represent uh, what was going on in those fossils I just showed you. Basically, it was a snake was in the uh, nest of a sauropod and eating the eggs and the young baby sauropods, and it was buried in the act. But another interesting thing uh, with fossils, we know that they weren't buried millions of years ago because we have this soft tissue present in them. So this is actually tissue from the bone of a T-Rex, and it's soft and it's springy. And on top of that, they found blood cells that were intact in these T-Rex bones. And there is actually a blood cell inside a blood vessel. And this is all published in the secular, you know, the secular literature. Even these bone cells called osteocytes that had those little finger-like uh, projections called philopodia, which are very sensitive, and, and they were buried, obviously, very quickly and only a few thousand years ago. These are still intact, these, these osteocyte bone cells. So it's really amazing all of this tissue uh, that has been found in fossils that should not be there if they were millions of years old. So let's look at the geological column. Does it really talk about or, or, or point to evolution? So according to uh, evolutionists, in sedimentary rocks, you don't have a whole lot of stuff there where you can radiometrically date things. So they date things by the fossils, and sometimes they date the fossils by the rocks, and it's all circular reasoning. But they claim 
they claim that, oh, life evolved, you know, from creatures in the ocean, and then these creatures went to land, and then from land, and so on and so forth. But really is what the geological column tells us is that stuff was buried by ecosystems. So we know the global flood happened over a year-long period. We can read that in the book of Genesis. So what would be buried first in that kind of a progressive flood? Well, marine creatures, right? So that's exactly what we see in the fossil record. And we see all these marine creatures and all the complex body plans associated with them, and many of these creatures are still alive today, showing up in the Cambrian strata, which would be the first uh, flood strata layer. And then, and then we see stuff that would be living more in coastal environments and shallow water showing up in the fossil record. And then in the uppermost layers, in the Cenozoic layers, then we see stuff like mammals and, 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 and insects and angiosperm plants and things that you would expect to be living at higher elevations. So basically, it's an ecological zonation process of burial. It doesn't point to evolution at all. And in fact, Dr. Tim Clary, a geologist here at ICR, used to work for Chevron, and he has been mapping uh, these mega sequences. So in the oil and gas industry, they wouldn't call something like the Cambrian. Uh, they, they would call it the Sock mega sequence, and then so on and so forth. But anyways, they correspond to sequences in the geological column. And he has literally mapped out the global flood over uh, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and now he's working through Asia. And he has shown in his research that, that the marine uh, creatures were buried first, and then creatures from coastal lowlands, and then creatures at higher elevations. And it makes perfect sense. It's just common sense. And he has not only uh, shown that, but he's shown that these continent that these deposits cover entire continents. So these aren't little local catastrophes. This is a global catastrophe with these layers covering entire regions of continents and also corresponding to each other between continents. And not only that, but we know that the flood happened very quickly because we see these things called polystrate fossil trees. Well, what normally happens when a tree dies out in the wilderness? It, it, after about you know, 20, 30 years or so, it rots and decomposes, right? Well, why do you have these fossil trees extending up through millions and millions of years of layers, it, assuming they're millions of years? Why are they extending through all these rock layers that evolutionists would claim formed over millions upon millions of years? Like a tree is really going to sit there and wait for millions of years to get buried by successive layers. Well, when you look at this, it's obvious it was done in a, in a flood, a very rapidly, quickly, and catastrophically. And you see these polystrate fossil trees all over the Earth. And in fact, here's one that not only goes up through a number of sedimentary layers, but also starts out uh, in a coal layer. And on top of that, why do we see rock layers that are folded all over the Earth and not fractured? Well, how can you fold rock if it's, if it's lithified and if it's hard? You can't. How do you fold rock? Well, it has to be soft, right? You know, anything has to be soft for you to fold it. And so we, we see these rock layers folded all over the earth. And we know from the scriptures that it says that, that at the end of the flood, God's, God caused mountain ranges to uplift on the continents, which would fold all these soft sedimentary layers. And we see this all over the world. I mean, it's amazing. There's a, a human being for scale there. And here's a layer that's folded at almost a 90 degree angle. And there's another uh, human there for scale. And you can see how, how massive those folds are. Well, how do you do that? You have to do that when they're moist, when they're soft. And then they, and then they lithify in this condition that you see there. So there's a couple of people there. Also, we don't see any erosion between rock layers. They're laid down uh, quite nicely, one on top of another. What's really interesting is that in 1980, Mount St. Helens uh, erupted, and we were able to look uh, at some geological processes in real time and see how things were, were actually created. This was actually a canyon over 100 feet deep that was carved out of, of sediments that were ash and, and, and sediments that were blown out of Mount St. Helens, uh, basically Spirit, Spirit Lake 
um, was breached and a bunch of water came down and these sediments were still soft. They'd been spewed out from the mountain not long before that. And a canyon uh, was carved out that looks like a miniature Grand Canyon. There's another picture. Look, you can see all the different layers in there. Well, I, we know they didn't take millions of years to form. <laughs> this canyon was formed in a matter of hours. And so it, it's like a miniature Grand Canyon. And so creation geologists were able to look at this and, and, and have excellent proof for how modern geological features like the Grand Canyon were actually formed. Well, let's talk about human evolution just a little bit. And I actually have an, a couple of entire talks I give on human evolution, so I'm just going to kind of give you the highlights. But we know uh, that there is nothing in the Bible talking about humans being evolved from apes. In the Bible, it says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. He created humans to be fully human right from the beginning. He, they weren't evolved from a population of hominids, as some Christians would try and claim. And in fact, that's this is really important to the message of the gospel and why Jesus Christ had to come to begin with. Because there was a real Adam, there was a real Eve, they really sinned, they really brought death, corruption, and evil into the world, which explains why we have the presence of evil in the world. And the Apostle Paul acknowledged this and said in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And then in 1 Corinthians 15.22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So human evolution completely really mucks up the entire gospel story if, if you want to believe that and promote it because there really was a real Adam, not, uh, not some evolving population of apes. And in fact, when we look at the fossil record uh, for humans and apes, that's really is all we see is apes and humans. Everything in between there is an artist's imagination that they, that they put in the picture to try and get you to believe that humans evolved from apes. And in fact, when we look uh, at the fossil record and we look at humans, human tools, artifacts, and footprints, we actually have the presence of humans on the Earth, if you want to accept these evolutionary dates and timelines. We actually have humans on the Earth before this group of fossil, fossils called Australopithecines, which were basically supposedly the first hominids evolving from apes. But actually, Australopithecines were nothing more than chimp-like creatures. But we actually have humans existing before they did based on, uh, based on this archaeological and paleontological evidence. The fact of the matter is, um, humans have always been humans, and there's just a lot of variation within humans. And it, but what about these so-called archaic traits uh, the evolutionists claim existed in, in things like Neanderthals and, and so forth? Well, it turns out those traits are still with us today, such as a pronounced brow ridge or a sloping forehead. So there's a dentist um, in South Africa who actually is a Christian and takes pictures of his patients that have these features. And look at this guy's brow ridge. I can assure you he uh, is alive and well today. And just because, say, Homo erectus or Neanderthals had large brow ridges, big deal. They're still with us today. Here's a bunch of athletes uh, from Eastern Europe. And you look at them, and they have huge brow ridges and sloping foreheads. And I can assure you they're alive and well and with us today. It's interesting that these characters are actually from the same region uh, of the world where we find a lot of Neanderthal. Uh, skeletons. What about this guy, uh, Nikolai Valuev? Look at his sloping forehead and his brow ridge, and I can assure you he's alive and well. He was a championship boxer, only lost one match, and now he's a member of the Russian parliament. And what about this thing called a sagittal crest? Or you might see some people where they have kind of a crest running down the middle of their head, and there's a kung fu guy with a very pronounced one. Uh, the guy up on the left there is a famous neurosurgeon. 
Uh, and I can assure you, he's not an archaic primitive guy. And then, of course, the guy up there on the right, I mean, he captains a star cruiser across the galaxy, so, so he must be pretty smart. But anyways, these traits are still found among modern humans, but there's just a lot of variation among humans. There's a couple of profess physics professors. Uh, one's very short, one's very tall, a couple of tennis players. Uh, a foot and a half difference between the two. Actually, that short guy just went to the finals of the Rome Masters <laughs> tournament uh, in Italy a few days ago. So anyways, but just, just a lot of variation in humans. It's not evolution. So where do we get all these people groups anyways around the world? Well, if we go to the scriptures, we find out exactly what happened. Because at the Tower of Babel, after the flood, humans decided they would basically form uh, their pre-flood pagan culture. They disobeyed God to go out over the world and fill it and, and to repopulate the earth, and God confused their languages. Well, what would happen if you confused the languages of a bunch of people? Well, you could only get so-and-so breeding with so-and-so, and you would get a bunch of genetic bottlenecks and all this diversity happening. That's exactly what we see. So anyways, there's a lot of data out there, but when we try and match it up with an assumption of naturalism or evolution and billions of years, it just doesn't fit. But when we take this data that we see out there, and it doesn't matter whether it's from biology or the fossil record or from living creatures or whatever, when we take that data and match it up with the Bible, it fits perfectly. In fact, it fits perfectly with biblical history and the things that happened in, that we are told in the book of Genesis. So think about it like this. These are the seven C's of history. So first we have the creation, and then we have what's called a corruption, or Adam and Eve fell in the, in the garden and brought sin, death, and corruption into the world. That's why we have everything seeming to go haywire all the time. Then we had a catastrophe or a global flood several thousand years after the creation. And then we had the confusion of languages at the Tower of Babel, which gives us all the different people groups around the world. And then we have Christ came in the fullness of time to die for our sins and to redeem mankind for what Adam and Eve brought into the world at the cross. And then very soon, I believe, in the future, we're going to have a consummation of all things where Jesus Christ returns. So actually, when we look at the Bible, it's very specific about all the different chronologies and genealogies within it. And when we add all those up, we come up with a creation of the world about 6,000 years ago, which actually matches well with the Hebrew calendar and what, what conservative Jews believe. But the problem is we've got all these scientists uh, basically beating all these theologians over the head with evolution, and we have them caving into it. So here's a cartoon. This scientist is saying the Bible is not true. The earth is millions of years old. I'm a scientist, believe me. And then we have all these theologians caving into this nonsense and saying, I have to add what he says to the Bible. He must know what he's talking about. And so that's why you have all this mixing of evolutionary ideas uh, going on at all these seminaries and Bible colleges. The fact of the matter is, is that deep time, evolutionary deep time is like this magic rug that evolutionists use to sweep all their problems under. In other words, no fo fossil transitions, uh, the design of living things, the order of the universe, all these obvious things that point to creator, they just sweep it under this rug of billions of years and it all seems magical. And in fact, George Wald, a Nobel laureate in, in the physics and chemistry of life, uh, said this, time is in fact the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, and the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself <laughs> performs miracles. And this is from an evolutionist. So evolution is basically a religious belief system. It has to be accepted by faith. And in fact, this character, John Dunphy, even uh, admitted that in this article, A Religion for a New Age, in the Humanist magazine. And he said, I am convinced that the battleground for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith, meaning evolution. 
But when we look at things logically, we look at the data logically, it's very easy to, to know that the Bible is true in all of these things. So anyways, I just want to promote a few books. I have a new uh, edition of the Design and Complexity of the Cell, which gets into some of this origin of life uh, material that I presented earlier in, in much more detail and other things. We have Creation Basics and Beyond, a book that has that's also been just freshly updated and it has excellent new material on geology, paleontology, biology, all these different fields. And it's, it's kind of a book that is a, a go-to uh, for just about any question that you have. And then Contested Bones, which is a book talking about uh, the fossil record in regards to human evolution. So if you're, I actually have an entire talk where I talk about the lack of transitional forms or ape men or the idea of human evolution. But if you want something that goes into excruciating detail on that subject, this is a great book, and that's in the bookstore too. And then, of course, we have a book, The Fossil Record, uh, by our own John Morris and Frank Sherwin that's also fair, been fairly recently updated, which is great. So we have a magazine called Acts and Facts. You can get that once a month delivered to your door. It's a beautiful, glossy magazine. Or you can get an electronic version of that, and I would sign up for that. And we have sign-up sheets, uh, I believe, that are available back there. And of course, you're all in the Discovery Center. And, and thank you for coming. And so that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Tompkins. All right, we have a few minutes. We can take some questions. I was told that our planetarium shows have uh, been bumped up from 12.05 to 12 noon as the new start time. So. We'll have to wrap things up here in about six or seven minutes uh, for those of you that have tickets to that 12 o'clock show. Do we have any questions here uh, from our in-house audience today? Yes, ma'am, in the far back. Now repeat the question for those of you here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, soft dinosaur tissue and uh, theories that the evolutionists come up with uh, for preservation of those tissues over long periods of time, including uh, a theory about iron and how it would potentially preserve those tissues. So can you speak to that, Dr. Tompkins? Yeah, a lot, you know, we find these preserved tissues and biochemicals in, in not only material from the Cretaceous where dinosaurs were found in the Jurassic, but we also find evidence of biomolecules uh, going all the way into the Cambrian layers too as well. So in many of these, many of these layers do not have iron present. And of course that, that iron theory has been totally debunked. Uh, actually our own uh, Dr. Brian Thomas, who is a paleo biochemist, has some articles on our website uh, related to that. Maybe Joel could, could post one of those where he actually, when that whole iron theory came up, uh, he totally showed that that was just totally bogus. And in fact, most evolutionists don't necessarily, um, at least the ones in the field, hold to that. That was just something thrown out there as kind of a move of desperation. But anyways, we find evidence of these, these soft tissues and biochemical compounds throughout the entire rock record, not just a few dinosaur bones. So this is a common occurrence. That's a great question, Ian. As uh, Dr. Tompkin mentioned, our website has all kinds of great resources that are free to you, articles that have been written, videos that we've produced on a wide variety of topics within the creation evolution debate. So check that out, totally free to you, right there at icr.org. Okay, we've got a question here from our YouTube viewers. Uh, this question is for Dr. Tompkins, can you please explain the human chromosome 2 fusion argument and why this does not prove human evolution? All right, well, I actually have an entire talk uh, on the human chromosome fusion 2, and I could probably talk about that for an hour. Um, I would recommend going to our website. I have a fairly recent article that I published on that that has all the updated information in it. But anyways, the, the so-called signature site um, of the fusion is very corrupt. 
Um, it doesn't really represent a fusion of two intact telomeres, and on top of that, it's in the middle of an active uh, RNA helicase gene. So how do you get two chromosomes slamming into each other and forming an important gene? Well, it doesn't happen. And so I've actually got lots of evidence uh, on the fusion site is actually uh, a promoter inside this gene in the first intron of the gene. So the fusion site is actually not some accident of any kind of fusion uh, whatsoever. It's a functional a controlling region where transcription factors, including RNA polymerase II, bind and create RNA transcripts. And so that's complete nonsense. And then the so-called cryptic centromere uh, also is inside the middle of a gene, and it's also a very poor, a very poor signature of what supposedly was supposed to be a centromere. It really, when you look at the, the DNA sequence, it doesn't even represent that at all. Um, but it's also in the middle of a gene, which is a huge protein coding gene, and is a transmembrane uh, spanning protein. And so both the so-called signatures of fusion um, are inside active functional genes, and so which totally debunks uh, the whole fusion scenario to begin with. <clears throat> and that's just the beginning of it. I actually have published uh, five or six articles on the fusion. Um, that you can pull up that address numerous issues as to why it's not valid, so. Very good. Great question there. Uh, for those of you here in person today, uh, Dr. Tompkins will actually be speaking again this Friday at 11.05 right here. These weekly presentations are free to you, so come back. Uh, you don't have to have a ticket uh, to get into the presentation. Just come back and join us. And this coming Friday, Dr. Tompkins' presentation will be on human evolution. So we will uh, you know, evaluate some different claims that the evolutionists make uh, from a scientific and biblical perspective, and he'll address those uh, to kind of throw out some of the arguments that they make. Uh, and uh, then for those of you watching online, next week, next Wednesday, we will be hearing from Mr. Frank Sherwin learning about the founders of science. And those of you who are here in the audience again today, you're welcome to come back for those as well. All right, we've got two minutes. Any other questions from our in-house audience? Yes, sir. What's the fallacy of carbon dating testing? Carbon dating testing. What fallacies might be involved in that method? Well, um, you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. Um, we actually have two scientists. One is a, a physicist who, who actually just wrote a book on radiometric dating, which we sell in the Discovery Center uh, that just came out, what, about a year ago, so it's fairly recent. And then, of course, Brian Thomas, who's a paleobiochemist, has uh, written on carbon dating and why it's not, why it's not really super accurate. So. It's my understanding, um, and I would suggest getting their material to get a good answer to your question. But the, the one thing that I know for a fact is that uh, even though carbon dating is, is, has its problems, uh, why is there carbon-14 in all of these fossils that are supposed to be millions of years old? It shouldn't be there. It's just like, you know, it's like the, uh, the soft tissue in these fossils. It should not be there. So. Why do we have carbon? And we've actually sent, you know, dinosaur bones and other things off to be carbon dated, and they come back full of carbon, 14. It shouldn't be there. But uh, having said all that as well, the, the dates you get uh, also have, have their issues with, with accuracy, and I, I couldn't give you the details on that. But. That's a great question, and uh, they, that's a, one we get pretty frequently. So check out that book. It's called Rethinking Radiometric Dating. That's by Dr. Vernon Cups. And then look for those articles by Dr. Brian Thomas on our website. Well, that's about all we have time for today. Thank you, Dr. Tompkins, for your time. Thank you, those of you here in person, for being here. And we hope that you're able to come back uh, even this coming Friday to hear uh, Dr. Tompkins bring a friend, family member, uh, someone that might need to hear that presentation uh, and enjoy your time here today at the Discovery Center. Those of you watching online, we look forward to seeing you next week as we hear from Mr. Frank Sherwin on the founders of science. Thank you all so much for being here today. God bless you.